I remember sitting at home uh, watching the U.S. Congress prepare to pass trillions of dollars in relief during the COVID-19 pandemic and saying to myself, uh, in three years, we're going to be hearing so much about fraud in all of this, be it the Paycheck Protection Program, which was set up to give money to businesses to keep their employees on payroll, and then also all of the money that went out for unemployment at the same time and the enhanced unemployment that was going out and just all of the funds being pushed out fast. It was uh, guaranteed there were going to be lots of stories coming out in the years afterwards of fraud in all of this. Well, with the uh, unemployment system, you heard about that with not just people unable to get through to the state's unemployment office, the Illinois Department of Employment Security, but also you started hearing of people who already have jobs, even congressmen, saying that uh, they were receiving debit cards with uh, unemployment funds on those debit cards when they never requested them. Even the governor himself says that his name uh, was compromised in the unemployment system. But when it comes to finding out the total... It took a long time, and the state did not want to divulge or couldn't divulge how much fraud there had been. Even audits going into all of the fraud, they couldn't find out because of poor records that were kept. Fingers pointed all over the place as to who's responsible for that. Was it a uh, uh, rushed system with enhanced unemployment benefits, uh, or was it uh, the state's handling of this? Of course, it's not just Illinois that had all this fraud. You had states across the country having just billions and billions of fraud. But the number came out to be about 5.2 or 5.3 billion just in Illinois from the unemployment system in quote overpayments. Uh, but again, uh, the full scope not really known because of poor record keeping. Uh, but then you look at the PPP. Program, the Paycheck Protection Program, that uh, pushed money out to businesses that wanted to get funds to keep their people on payroll despite them not being open because of state government orders telling them to stay home. So now we're finding out that, uh, yeah, businesses got this money and some questionable businesses, you know, why would a luxury car dealer need to get millions of dollars in PPP? Yeah, not too sure, but regardless, uh, money went out to all kinds of businesses. We're talking trillions of dollars. Uh, over the span of about uh, two and a half to three years, uh, just in PPP and state governments getting money and uh, school districts getting money and libraries and and uh, local municipal governments getting money, uh, all of the unemployment money that went out. Uh, but we're now hearing stories, including uh, state governments saying 177 people have been referred to law enforcement for PPP fraud, quote, so far. Uh, now we're hearing more about uh, even mail carriers here in Springfield. Uh, being suspected of PPP fraud. How do we get to the bottom of all of this? I talked with Christine Adams. She is a former federal prosecutor who uh, now works in a a private law firm, and uh, she, she spelled out some of the particulars on how taxpayers could possibly get this money back if indeed there's going to be criminal prosecutions. Taxpayers are certainly going to see some of the money back because the government is focusing its its efforts on going after those people who um, either to a criminal extent or even to a a civilly liable extent falsified information um, on the loan applications to get those monies. I guess the question is how much though. So for instance, uh, you know, many of, I mean, the fraud was so widespread. You had a lot of people who could just simply fill out an application, claim to be somebody they were not with a false SSN or a false EIN, and then just get the money. And then when they received the money, they just spent it, you know, cars, trips, luxury items. Uh, People like that, you're not going to be able to recover any funds from because they've spent all the funds. But um, if there's individuals who still have some monies or some access to monies, then, and the government goes after them, then the government can recover some of the money. You know, and then... uh, There's a criminal pursuit, and then there's also the civil pursuit. And under the Civil False Claims Act, which is the likely statute that the government will use to bring civil claims against these individuals, uh, there's the opportunity to get trouble damages. Although typically, 
when these matters are settled, uh, the government settles for double damages. So obviously a lot to be left on the on the table when it comes to recapturing some of that fraud. Uh, and our taxpayers going to ever be made whole? That seems to not be the case. But also you got to consider the taxpayer cost of investigating all of this fraud. And that's something else that uh, uh, Christine Adams, a former federal prosecutor now in the private sector, uh, highlights how difficult it is to investigate these claims. You know, it's going to take a lot of resources because you're investigating a lot of people. I mean, this I think this was a unique situation where it was almost culturally acceptable for people who had never previously committed crimes or run afoul of the law to submit a false application. You know, you have even, you know, kids, 20-year-olds, people who, you know, don't quite have the judgment they ought to have and are still developing it, submitting um you know, false loan applications because their peers are also doing it. So there's a lot of that. Um, it's, it, you know, now the government has all the paperwork. So the government can go back and, do you know, look at the low-hanging fruit. So, you know, what, who used false SSNs, who used false EINs. You know, I, I heard, I read somewhere that there were 150 loan applications that all use the same phone number that went to a gas station somewhere. Um, you know, SSNs of incarcerated individuals were used. Like those are things that are easy to, to figure out and determine and identify as fraudulent. Um, other cases will take more work. Uh, if uh, businesses were actually legitimate and um, companies are claiming they use the money for payroll, it may be more difficult to determine, did they actually use that money for payroll? So obviously, a lot of investigation needs to go into these things, and who knows if they're going to actually get to the bottom of it and whether or not it's going to go uh, towards uh, you know criminal liabilities um, and, and actually have some kind of, um, uh, you know, restitution paid? That's um, a good question. I think there's certainly controversy now about, I think everyone agreed that people needed relief quickly. You know, businesses needed relief quickly. Employees that wanted to keep their jobs needed relief quickly. But the question really is, did it have to be this quick? And one good example of that is um, the the chair of the, what is it called, the pandemic, he's the pandemic watchdog chairman, Michael Horowitz. And he points out that the government elected not to use the do not pay Treasury Department database, which keeps a list of debarred contractors, fugitives, felons, and people convicted of tax fraud. And his position is that the government, while it wanted to get money as quickly as it could, could have taken the, you know, the 48 hours or probably up to a week maximum to at least consult this database to determine whether the applications they were reviewing were fraudulent um, and that this was a miss on the government's part. So, again, um, lessons learned. Uh, they pushed that money out pretty quick. Was that too quick? Uh, should they have uh, maybe put a few more controls on for a week or two weeks just to double check lists of do not pay <laughs> of people who may have already have, uh, run afoul with uh, federal law to some degree? Uh, so it's it's uh, interesting to see, you know, uh, in retrospect, looking back, should there have been more controls on all of this? Uh, again, uh, Christine Adams, former federal prosecutor, now in private practice, uh, talking about PPP fraud, investigating it, lessons learned, uh, but also uh, some final thoughts and how sometimes, you know, it's kind of murky when you investigate these types of things. It's, you know, there's also a lot of gray area around what people did. It's going to be, I think, challenging for the government to prove that everyone that had mistakes or errors or wrong statements on their loan applications were actually intending to commit fraud because many people may have just made honest mistakes. You know, that this program, these programs were rolled out so rapidly. Um, there was really pandemonium everywhere. Like banks had trouble getting the portals opened up. Um, the forms, the application forms that people were filling out kept changing over time. 
the Small Business Administration rules kept changing over time. So, I mean, how often do you have a program of this scale being rolled out this fast? I mean, just imagine you've got new forms, new rules, a new program, new requirements. Um, there's just opportunity for lots of error that, you know, was probably made in good faith. So, again, uh, we'll likely hear more stories of Paycheck Protection Program fraud uh, headline last week. Area postal workers among 19 indicted on charges of PPP fraud. The SJR reporting that uh, several individuals charged in August with uh, wire count, uh, wire fraud counts and more. Uh, and this is uh, just a small sampling. Uh, again, last week you also had the uh, Office of Executive Inspector General highlighting 177 state employees. You've got uh, employees out of the Co- County out of Chicago, uh, and I imagine you'll hear even more of these types of stories highlighted. Uh, as uh, it's something that you know, when you violate the public trust in stealing paycheck protection program money, that's tax dollars that should be going towards something else. And whether or not we're actually going to get all of those resources back, still unknown. Uh, so a lot more to come on all of that. 